Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clint Kelly. I am a member of technical staff at Wibby Data, and I'm gonna speak for the next 30 or 40 minutes about Kiji. Kiji is an open source platform that you can use to build personalized big data applications on top of Cassandra. First, I'll step through the agenda for today. I'm gonna to begin by describing the problem we were trying to solve when we built Kiji. That is, what it means to build a big data application and why it can be difficult. Next, I'll talk about how Kiji works and how we can use this open source platform to more easily build the kinds of applications I'm going to describe. Third, I'll talk a little bit about how we use Kiji in production and describe some real life use cases where we use Kiji to build real time big data applications. And finally, I'll talk about how we've added support in Kiji to run on top of Cassandra, what our data model looks like, and some of the pitfalls we ran into and how we got around them. Uh, just a little context, we originally developed Kiji to sit on top of HBase and not Cassandra. We added support for Cassandra this year. Uh, so this gives you a little flavor of what it's like to add support in a system that was designed for HBase for Cassandra as well. So first, the problem. Let's say that you're a developer and you want to build a personalized real-time big data application. I've shown a few well-known canonical examples here. To be a little bit more specific, let's say that you work at a retailer like this Acme clothing company and you want to personalize your customers' experiences. Let's say that you want to add, for example, personalized product recommendations to your website when users add something to their shopping cart, for instance. So how might we go about personalizing product recommendations? We could begin most obviously by looking at the contents of a user's shopping cart and what products he or she has purchased or viewed in the past. Uh, for example, if I buy a pair of trousers or if I've just added a pair of trousers to my shopping cart, it probably makes sense to recommend to me a shirt or a pair of shoes that will match those trousers. We can also go further and look at things like whether a given user spends a lot of time looking at customer reviews. If I read a lot of customer reviews, it probably makes sense to recommend to me items that have four or five star, star averages. We can likewise look at whether a given user spends a lot of time filtering or sorting by price. These might be users who are price inelastic if they, source, if they sort from expensive to inexpensive. Or if they go the other way and filter for the cheapest items, these might be users to whom we rec want to recommend inexpensive products. And we can continue personalizing in this manner by doing things like looking at what users have searched for previously on our site, how they've interacted with, the mobile with our mobile application, and so on. And just to be clear, we can personalize our application in ways far beyond just product recommendations. As a couple of examples, we could serve personalized content to the user's mobile device. We could give the user personalized search results. And we could also offer a user personalized promotions. I'll work through this example, however, of personalized product recommendations just as a simple motivation for the rest of the talk. So given that concrete example of what we might want to build, how do we go about doing so? A good place to start is with all of the proven, scalable, open source, big data software that's available out there. If we're going to be building a personalized application, we're going to need to record a lot of user interactions. So all those things I discussed before, like search terms, things you've added to your shopping cart, price filters, and so on. A good place to store that data is Apache Cassandra, which you've all heard today is great for this kind of high volume, high velocity time series data. Once we have this user interaction data stored in Cassandra, we'll need a way to analyze it. Apache Hadoop is a great, is the natural choice for analyzing this kind of high volume data. And along with Cassandra and Hadoop, there's a pretty large ecosystem of other proven, scalable big, te big data technologies we can use. And we're fortunate to have companies like Datastax that provide to us suites of these open source technologies and a nice bundle that's certified and ready for enterprise production. So these technologies give us a good start, but we still have a lot of functionality that we need to build on top of them to get to our final personalized big data application. So let's talk a little bit more about what that functionality is that we need to build. 
To begin with, we need a way to get all this information about our users into Cassandra. We may design our applications such that we record a lot of user interactions to log files or relational databases. We can use Hadoop MapReduce or similar technologies to bulk load this data into Cassandra. We'll likely also want to design some kind of a RESTful interface that will allow us to stream user interactions as they occur in real time and write them to our database. Once we have our user interactions stored in Cassandra, we'll have data scientists on our team. We're going to want a way to query Cassandra, inspect this data, and use standard familiar data science tools like R or Python to run some analyses and gain some insights and then use those insights to, de uh, to develop some machine learning models. Once a data scientist has created a machine learning model, he's going to need to train it. This is the trained model. Uh, the data scientist, again, oops, again, could go about doing this training with standard data science tools like R or Python. These are familiar and very accessible, but they usually don't scale out to the quantity of data that we can hold in a data store like Cassandra. For running analyses on these large data sets, again, Hadoop is the natural choice. But writing mappers and reducers is usually not the best job for a data scientist. And anyone who's worked with this technology knows that it's not terribly accessible. So a big part of our personalized application and building it is going to be providing some tools that provide a good balance between the accessibility and familiarity of R and Python and the scalability of in Hadoop analysis. So here are a couple open source examples that we might find useful getting started with such an application. As an aside, when I talk about this trained machine learning model, for the purposes of the example I'm showing today, we can think of it as a function. The inputs of this function are all of the data that we've gathered about how a given user has interacted with our application. So again, everything that the user has added to his or her shopping cart, clicks, impressions, views, add to wish list, et cetera. The output of this function is a set of personalized product recommendations for this user. Again, in the general case, this could be something totally different, but for the purposes of this application, I'll talk about product recommendations. In any case, after the, our data scientist has trained this machine learning model, we then want to apply it to generate product recommendations for our users. So how do we do that? One pretty straightforward way to do it is, again, to use Hadoop. We can pretty easily write a MapReduce job that will read all of the information we have about all of our users out of Cassandra in a large batch operation, apply the machine, the machine learning model, and generate a set of personalized recommendations, uh, one set for each user. This is really straightforward. This is good enough for a lot of applications. And it's pretty easy to make this scale and make it reliable. The only downside is that this is a batch operation. We're likely only going to be able to run it every few hours at most. And it has a couple downsides I'll get to in a second. Finally, once we have these personalized recommendations written into Cassandra, we need a way to get them back to our application so that we can show them to our end user. I talked earlier about having a RESTful interface. It's straightforward to use the same interface for reading data back out of Cassandra and sending it to our application. So to review where we are right now, let's say we have a user and he or she visits our clothing website and comes to a page on this site that has some real estate reserved for these personalized product recommendations. Our application will talk via REST to Cassandra and make a query for the latest set of recommendations for this user to show them on the screen. Cassandra will have some of these recommendations for every user from the batch job I described earlier. So it'll serve them back via REST to the application the application will serve them to the user, and he'll see his, his shirts and trousers and so on. So the disadvantage of this system is that we derive these customer, these product recommendations in batch. So they're based on all of the information we had about a given user up until the time we ran that batch operation. So they probably don't include things that the user has done in the last five minutes or maybe even in the last hour. And if we're building an application like the one I've described here, that's the kind of information that's most critical in providing high-quality, personalized content to our users. 
Now I'll discuss how we can do better and how we can serve higher quality recommendations that take into account the user's up to the second behavior. So again, let's say we have a user. He visits the web page, the application, makes a call to Cassandra via REST for the latest set of recommendations for this user. And now we insert some application logic around Cassandra. This logic sees this request for recommendations, and it knows that recommendations are something that are derived from applying a machine learning model. So the application logic will trigger a real-time application of this model. These models are usually pretty expensive to train, but not very expensive to apply or score. So we can do this in real time within the latency of our applications typically very easily. This real-time application of the machine learning model will generate fresh recommendations for this user based on whatever up to the second information we have about how he or she is interacting with our application. So now we get the freshest possible set of recommendations. We write them back to Cassandra. We also send them back to our application via REST. Our user sees higher quality content and hopefully we get a promotion for designing a better application. To review, there are three main types of functionality that we want to build in an application like this. To begin with, we want a way to get data into Cassandra from our application and then to read it back out. And we especially want to be able to do so via REST. The next piece of functionality we need is a way for our data science team to inspect the data that we've stored in Cassandra gain some insights from that data, and then use those insights to develop and train machine learning models. Finally, we want a way to score or apply these models, and especially to do so in real time. This is a fair amount of, tech of functionality to build on top of these proven open source technologies like Hadoop and Cassandra. And it was with this in mind, with bridging this gap between these open source tools and your final application, that we at Wibby Data developed the Kiji project. This is an open source platform that you can use to get a head start and avoid reinventing the wheel when you're building an application like this. And instead, as developers, get to concentrate on whatever it is that makes your application unique. That covers a quick overview of the problem we were trying to solve when we developed Kiji. I'll now describe how Kiji works, its architecture, and how you can use it to build these kinds of applications. First, a little bit of history about the Kiji project. We developed it at Wibby Data, where I work. We're a startup company in San Francisco, founded a few years ago by folks from Google and Cloudera, who had a lot of experience building these kinds of personalized big data applications on top of open source technologies like Hadoop. As I stated earlier, we originally developed Kiji a few years ago on top of HBase and Hadoop, but we've seen such strong increase in demand in the community and among our enterprise customers at Wibby Data for Cassandra that we modified Kiji this year to run on top of Cassandra as well as HBase. So how does Kiji work? At the heart of Kiji is a storage system. You can think of it as sitting between the engineering and data science teams at your organization. This storage system we call Kiji Schema and it's a thin API layer on top of either Cassandra or HBase. The engineers in your organization can, use, can uh, use APIs to write data from your application into the storage system. Again, if you've designed your application such that you capture a lot of user interactions into log files or relational databases, or maybe if you have some legacy data that's still in flat files on HDFS, you can use a component called Kiji MapReduce to bulk load this data into Kiji using Hadoop MapReduce. If you'd like to stream user interactions in real time as they occur, we offer a component called Kiji REST that lets you use JSON over HTTP to write the Kiji. And likewise, you can use the same component, Kiji REST, to stream data out of your database and serve it back to your application. We can think of Kiji logically as having one row for every user of your application and then having hundreds or thousands or potentially even millions of columns in each row. And these columns could contain typical metadata about each user or more likely lots and lots of time series data about these add to carts, these clicks, impressions, views, and so on. On the data science side of the house, 
we can read data out of Kiji schema using Hive SQL with a component called Kiji Hive. Once a data scientist has read this data out of Kiji, he or she can analyze it, again, using standard data science tools like R or Python, gain some insights, and use those insights to develop a machine learning model. Again, we can train the machine learning model using R or Python that has the downsides I discussed earlier. To train the machine learning model over the full amount of data we can store in Kiji schema, in Kiji we have a couple of components. The first is Kiji MapReduce. In Kiji MapReduce, we have a library of training algorithms for things like k-means, um, k-means, naive Bayes, collaborative filtering, and so on. Uh, again, if MapReduce is not the most accessible technology, so if you'd like something easier to use, we provide Kiji Express. Kiji Express is a Scala-based DSL for describing MapReduce jobs. It's based on Scalding, which is an open source project from Twitter. It provides a way for describing fairly complicated chains of MapReduce operations in Scala in a way that resembles applying functional programming techniques to Scala collections libraries. It's also very similar to Spark. In any case, however, we train this machine learning model. We're now going to want to apply it through scoring to generate our derived customer insights, whether those are product recommendations or something else. In Kiji, we have the notion of a score. A score takes a machine learning model and some information about a user and applies the, applies the model to compute some derived customer result. In the case of our earlier example, this result would be a set of product recommendations. Again, we can use our machine learning model uh, to score in batch. This has the timeliness downsides I discussed earlier. We support this kind of batch scoring in Kiji, but we also naturally have a mechanism for real-time scoring. There are a couple of additional components we use for this. They're called Kiji scoring and the Kiji model repository. Once we've trained a machine learning model, we upload the associated, and we're ready to use the associated score for real-time scoring, we upload that score to the model repository. Now, and again, if we go through our previous example, when a user visits our website, our application makes a request to Kiji REST for some data that's stored in Kiji. And in this case, Kiji scoring is that application logic that sees a request for a column that's a result of applying a machine learning model. It will talk to the appropriate score in the model repository. And that score will requ request all of the information we need about a given user and apply the machine learning model to generate our personalized product recommendations. It'll then write these back to our Kiji table and serve them back via Kiji REST so that we can render them on our user's screen and again, get our happy result. So to review, there were, again, three pieces of functionality we said we needed to build in one of these big data applications. The first was we needed a way to get data in and out of Cassandra. Uh, for this in Kiji, we supply the components Kiji REST and Kiji MapReduce. We want a way to inspect our data and then train machine learning algorithms. For this purpose in Kiji, we provide Kiji Hive, Kiji MapReduce, and Kiji Express. And finally, we want a way to do scoring with this model and to do so in real time. And to this end in Kiji, we provide the model repository and Kiji scoring. One other note, this architecture I've shown is highly modular. So if some of you are building applications that resemble this but use maybe uh, your application is a subset of what I've shown or some kind of a superset, it's really easy to use only the components that you need and to design new components, maybe some kind of streaming operation with Kafka and Storm, for example, and plug it into this architecture. So that covers what Kiji is and how you can use it to build these kinds of applications. Now I'll talk briefly about how we use it in production with real commercial customers. A couple of use cases I chose to highlight today. We use Kiji in one 
Fortune 150 retailer and also in a top luxury retailer for as a personalization engine. This covers some of the use cases I described earlier, things like product recommendations uh, and so on. We also use Kiji, or Kiji's also used in production by Opower. For any of you that get power bills from places like PG&E, you'll probably see some information about how much energy you're using relative to your neighbors, what you're predicted to use in the future, and some suggestions on how you can save energy. So they store all of this data in Kiji tables, do analyses on it, and provide these kinds of personalized uh, power saving recommendations. Today I'm gonna talk really quickly about how we use Kiji on Cassandra at this top luxury retailer. One thing, uh, one other note, so this luxury retailer uses Kiji and also uses some of our enterprise software that we build at Wibby Data. This enterprise software is an example of the kind of end-to-end -end application that you could build on top of this platform I'm describing today. So it includes a lot of retail-specific functionality, machine learning, models, uh, table layouts, as well as UIs, consoles, and so on for folks that work at companies like this. To get data into Kiji with this particular customer, we bulk load a lot of historical data. So these are things like product catalogs or customer order histories. We wrote MapReduce jobs in Kiji Express that take these flat files on HDFS and load them into Cassandra. And the table layouts we're using in Cassandra are specific retail, tail, excuse me, specific retail layouts that are part of Wibby Retail. We capture real-time interactions that users have with this application using Kiji REST. We have some specific, uh, excuse me, some JavaScript that we use to instrument the customer's website. So whenever you do things like clicking on something or adding a product to a cart, it'll stream this information in, re in real time through Kiji REST and write at the Kiji schema. Our data science team, or the data science team of the customer, excuse me, does all kinds of analyses using jobs that are written in Kiji Express. Some of these are pretty straightforward algorithms that all of you are, are familiar with for things like recommendations. Uh, we also have a number of retail specific algorithms that are part of Wibby Retail. And finally, we serve personalized content in real time using a system built on top of technologies like Kiji REST. So we have an endpoint, uh, and again, if a user visits a web page, for example, from this customer. This endpoint will read all the information we have in Kiji Schema about that customer, trigger the appropriate score, and generate some personalized content that we write back to Kiji Schema and also serve via Kiji REST. That covers a really quick use case example. I'll be happy to answer any questions offline if anybody has, wants to know more about this. Uh, so with the remaining time today, I'm going to talk about how we modified Kiji to work on top of Cassandra. Kiji's data model is very similar to that of Bigtable. For those who are familiar, Bigtable is the kind of ancestor of technologies like Cassandra and HBase. In Kiji, we store all of our data in tables. Tables are made up of rows. Rows have a row key as well as some kind of a data payload. The row key we call, in Kiji, we call an entity ID. An entity ID can be made up of multiple components, some hashed and some unhashed. This is very similar in Cassandra to how you can have a partitioning key, or sorry, a primary key that has a partitioning key and clustering columns. The data within a row, we divide up into multiple column families. Each column family contains multiple columns. And up until now, this data model is pretty similar to what you get in Cassandra. It differs in that we offer explicit support for different timestamped versions of every cell in a Kiji table. This is similar to how HBase behaves and also how Bigtable behaves. Under the hood, Cassandra also stores different timestamped versions of every cell, but as users, we're not exposed to those, and Cassandra uses them instead to resolve different data from different replica nodes. Within each cell, oh, so users of Kiji, by the way, can use these different timestamp versions for doing things like storing time series data. Within each cell, we support complex data types. We use Avro for serialization and deserialization of data. 
And so you can have records that contain things like strings and integers, as well as nested maps and lists. Within Kiji, we also have a notion of locality groups. Column families, uh, when you're designing a table layout in Kiji, you can use column families to logically organize your data and then use locality groups to control how these column families are physically stored on disk. As a motivating example, let's say that you're building an application in which you have some column families that contain columns that you'd like to use for batch operations and some that contain columns that you'd like to use for real-time operations. Some of these you'd probably want to store in memory, have cached all the time. Others you might want to compress, for example. Uh, but as a user, you might find it more convenient to think of these columns as all logically being in the same table. So as a Kiji user, you could set up a couple of locality groups, one of which you'd use for your batch column families and one for your real-time column families. And these, will get, these column families will now get stored separately on disk. So we can assign separate attributes to the column families, similarly to how we would apply different attributes to tables in CQL. We can give them properties like whether or not they're cached, compressed, and so on. So that covers the Kiji data model. Uh, I'll go really quickly how we, modif how we map that data model to Cassandra and then describe some of the pitfalls we ran into over the last year and how we've gotten around them. A locality group, since each locality group is stored separately on disk, we map locality groups to tables. The entity IDs, again, are our row keys. So we map these to the primary key in Cassandra. The column family name, the column name, which we call a qualifier, as well as the version information, we map to clustering columns. And we use this information to control how we order data when we store it on disk. And finally, the values that we actually store in these columns, we save as blobs. Because again, we're using Avro for serializing and deserializing our data. So some of the issues we ran into over the last nine months or so. Uh, to begin with, in Kiji, we support a lot of operations that cross locality groups. So you can do things like issue a single request in Kiji that will read or write data from or to multiple locality groups. This is tricky since we obviously can't have a single read that reads data from multiple Cassandra tables. So in the, key, in the implementation of Kiji that runs on top of Cassandra, we made extensive use of the asynchronous API that Datastax offers. And this was really critical in making sure that Kiji on Cassandra was performant. In Kiji, we also allow compare and set operations across locality groups. This is something that's possible in HBase. So as part of our original Kiji API, and this is one of the, the few examples of where we had to break API compatibility and just not support this in the Cassandra version of Kiji. For what it's worth in production with our enterprise customers, this has never been an issue. One of the big problems we ran into was with filtering. Uh, for any of you who've ever used, well, for those of you who haven't used HBase, it has a very rich set of server-side filters. And the, the version of Kiji that runs on top of HBase can have filters, for example, that will return rows only that have data values that match a certain regular expression. And this is something that's really not possible in Cassandra, and it's kind of against a lot of the design philosophies of Cassandra itself, where we usually want to denormalize our tables such that we're only doing very simple reads that scan contiguously over disk. Wherever we could, we used where clauses to implement these filters in the Cassandra version of Kiji. So if you have filters that are filtering based on the column name or the timestamp value, for example, those are things we were able to support. We ended up using a lot of allow filtering originally. You've probably heard a lot of pretty bad things about this today. Uh, and we also experimented a lot with secondary indices. This didn't work out so well when we started dealing with 
production level payloads on big clusters. And so we got rid of all of those and our, our fallback solution was really just to do what, as much filtering as we could with simple where clauses. Otherwise, we just do it on the client side. And really, we just optimized the way that we design our tables for things like the retail applications I described earlier, such that our queries never have to use these kinds of, never have to use allow filtering or never require secondary indices. We ran into similar problems when it came to doing multi-row scans. We use these mostly for MapReduce when we're doing those kinds of batch machine learning operations I showed earlier. Uh, again, we experimented a lot with allow filtering. We ran into a lot of read timeouts. Uh, one of the things that makes this really tricky is you can have a, a kind of query you want to, you're writing that works really well on a single row in Cassandra. It's doing a nice contiguous scan. But if you do this over multiple rows in something like a MapReduce job, suddenly even though you're doing one contiguous scan per row, you're probably skipping a lot, of, uh, a lot of data when you move between rows, if that makes sense. So we, again, worked with, tried some things with allow filtering, changing the read timeouts on Cassandra tables. Uh, again, didn't work out so well. So we went back to the same solution of implementing limited client-side filtering and really providing warning messages when we do this so that users know that they could be hosing their networks. And again, went back to our layouts and optimized them so that the data we're storing that we need to analyze in batch in these kinds of uh, batch machine learning algorithms, we've organized it such that those are all nice contiguous scans. So in summary, there were three types of functionality I said we needed to build. The first was we need a way when we're building a personalized big data application to get data into Cassandra and then to read it back out. And for this in Kiji, we provide Kiji REST and Kiji MapReduce. We want a way for our data scientists to be able to inspect the data stored in Cassandra and then use that data to gain insights and train machine learning models. And for this, we provide Kiji Hive, Kiji MapReduce, and Kiji Express. And finally, we want a way to do scoring in real time to deliver customers the highest quality, or excuse me, highest possible quality personalized content. For this in Kiji, we provide the model repository and Kiji scoring. If you're interested in giving this a try, we have a development kit called the Kiji Bento Box. This is pretty easy to use. You just download a tarball, run one command to get it started, and you can install Kiji instances and begin creating tables and so on. We have some tutorials. Oh, so this, the bento box will start up Cassandra, Zookeeper, MapReduce, HDFS, uh, as well as HBase. So you have everything you need to experiment in the kind of ecosystem we use for Kiji. Uh, and you can use it on Linux or, or OS X. I want to thank the Cassandra community. Uh, those of us, all of us at Wibby Data really didn't have experience with Cassandra before this year. All of the folks on the mailing list, at the meetups, and at all the various different conferences have been a big help. It was also really great to have all the webinars, conference videos, and so on online, and all of the, the great training from Datastax. So again, if you're interested, give Kiji a try. You can go to kiji.org, download a Cassandra version of the Bento Box. We have a couple of tutorials that will get you started building things like a music recommender and address book on top of Cassandra with Kiji. <laughs>